You're listening to Sarah Hagen Backstage, with interviews and insights from years inside the music industry. Join Sarah as she talks with masters of their crafts, finding out what makes them tick, both inside and outside of the music business. Welcome to Sarah Hagen Backstage. My guest today, Dave Weckl, is an absolute drumming legend. He has not only played with an amazing array of musicians in multiple genres over his past decades in the music industry, such as Chick Corea, Mike Stern, Paul Simon, Robert Plant, and many more, but he made a name for himself as the ultimate drummer's drummer with his many drumming videos, masterclasses, and clinics. We are going to talk about the music and the teachings that shaped his personal sound, his journey as a drummer and musician, and the many incredible projects he has coming up. So come along with me as I catch up with Dave Weckl. Dave, welcome to the podcast. Sarah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Absolutely. You've been one of the most requested guests on this podcast. So it's That's nice. really, really fantastic to make this happen. Always nice to be requested. Absolutely. Um, and how have you been? I, I got to see you over the summer, but um, how have things been for you lately? Yeah, going to the PAS thing, the, the, the whole thing there in the summer was really was really cool to judge that contest with uh, with Aaron and that. That was really a lot of fun. Um, yeah, been good. Uh, busy. It's been it's been busy. I, I think most people maybe know by now that I, I went through a huge move a year and a half ago from uh, from LA uh, back to my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, got a bunch of well, a little bit of family left here and, and a lot of friends who um, it's kind of like the stars aligned. So a lot, of, a lot of people like Jay Oliver and Bill Lenehan, and, you know, guys that I grew up with, we sort of all have gone out and around. And, and at this point in, in our lives, we're kind of all back here, at least, uh, you know, in temporary fashions, we're all kind of jumping still. But, uh, mm-hmm. but it's really nice. It's, um, you know, my, my record company folks are here, Rod and Mike Silverman. So with uh, it's on, on Hill Records. And uh, yeah, it's just been a, a quest, you know, to uh, build a build my studio here, kind of my lifelong dream of having a, a proper uh, room that's not just a two-car garage uh, made into a studio. So it's, uh, it's going to be a nice big space. And uh, we're about, I'd say there's probably about 20% left. So we're, we're getting there. And um, so that's been cool. And besides that, uh, been touring a lot with Tom Kennedy we, with our project that we're co-leading, and that's been a bunch of fun. Uh, we got a, got a little tour coming up on the West Coast again in October. So you can check my website for, for those dates. And uh, and some real exciting news here in St. Louis. I'm, uh, there's so many great musicians here, and, and I was uh, I've been discovering a lot of them that I didn't know before I left back in 19. 19- 79 um and uh, so i'm actually putting together a couple of groups and, uh, and they couldn't be more diverse one of them is uh is, is a, again a lifelong dream really to put together my own big band so i'm i'm finally getting to do that and there's just some great players here uh you know so we're we have a, the best pros in town that um my friends Kevin Janino, who's a legendary drummer here in St. Louis that I've known since the 70s. I remember seeing him when I was in uh, middle school and he was in high school. And I was just like, wow, Kevin, you know. So Kevin's been out and around and doing a bunch of stuff, but he's, he's still based here. So between him and Dave Dickey, who is uh, one of the one of the leading uh, band leaders in town that has a lot of work in his own big band. And, these guys are helping to contract the band and put it together. So it's um, couldn't do it without them for sure. So we're, we got the best pros in town, but we're also, I wanted to include uh, as many kids as possible too. Um, so we have, uh, we've got four of the uh, best all state uh, guys that are in the band from, uh, from different schools here, which is really, really cool and exciting to include them. So, and um, yeah, we just uh, we just had a rehearsal last week, uh, first rehearsal kind of meeting, get together, and and we played through some, uh, you know, just some old old charts that I grew up playing to from like Native Ferguson, Woody Herman, of course Buddy Rich, and, and uh, you know, getting a few of my own songs arranged, and uh, yeah, so we're looking forward to uh, 
to the whole process of uh, you know, getting it rehearsed, getting a look, getting a gig happening. Uh, I want to record this band and we'll see what happens after that. So. That's so, so great. And I, I just have to say, I saw your social media post about this. The Dave Weckl St. Louis Big Band Contingent is the name of it, right? So I just. That's right. My marketing manager, Steve Work, and he said, that name's a little long. I said, I don't care. I like it. <laughs> so I want the, yeah, just, it's, that's the name of it. It just it's came to me. So it's going to fly with that. Yeah, my wife, my wife, Clivia, was so, um, you know, supportive because. Yeah, you know, a lot of people in town, they were like, oh, no, you're going to be able to put together a big band here. She was just like, go oh, do it, just do it, just do it, you have to. And so it was, it was nice to, to do it, realize it, and I think it surprised a lot of people, including yeah. me. It was, it was really, really great. I mean, the first run through, everybody was like, wow, okay, this is good. This is going to be good. So, Such a good feeling. And, and I could just feel the passion come through your Instagram post about this. It just, it was like, you know, you were your excitement for it was was fantastic and it uh, it must remind you a little bit like including the high school students in this it must it must remind you of your experience a little bit well listen my my high school was uh, francis howell high school which is local here out in Weldon springs missouri and um you know that's that's all we were about the, the, my friends here that we were in the band together uh Namely, my my good friend Wayne Smith that passed away unfortunately last year, uh, trumpet player. We 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 were just all about the band, and, and um, I I was in the high school jazz band since I was in eighth grade, which I wasn't in high school yet. So it was uh, that that was um, that was one of those moments that uh, you know forced you to practice because you have to rise to the occasion. And uh, mm -hmm. never forget Al McKeon giving me the opportunity to to be in that band so and i think I, I, there's a record floating around somewhere that we actually recorded in 1974 when i was 14. so wow that's pretty cool um i actually have it somewhere here in a box but i haven't been back yet but um but yeah it uh you know i just we we grew up big bands were so uh you know uh, popular they were they were big here um, mm -hmm. And uh, anytime Buddy or Maynard or Woody, any, any of the big bands, anytime they came through, it was like we, were all, we would just all go and hang and, and watch them. And, you know, like I said in the post, my father was kind of responsible for introducing me to the whole, you know, contemporary big band thing. And it, that, of course, started with Buddy. So it was, uh, you know, so, so playing a lot of these charts is, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to do that with, with the actual Buddy Rich band with Kathy Rich and in the past many times. And it's always been so cool. So, um, so we'll sprinkle the set with a few of those. And, uh, That's like great. Said, I'm, I'm trying to get some of my tunes arranged, which we do have uh, one right now. And, uh, getting another one from Tom Kennedy that uh, we, we posted a Latin thing online um, last year that, uh, that we played where four, four trumpet players joined us from uh, Slovenia. And um, and uh, so that one's getting arranged, which will be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's really, it, it's really cool. We, we, I just, like I said, I've always wanted to do this and I just, my career just didn't allow the time and I, I needed help and it's, you know, it's kind of funny. LA is just so big and spread out. And everybody's so busy. It just kind of, it, it's like, you don't know where to reach to, to really, at least I didn't. I was buried in my garage and when I wasn't, I was on the road. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so coming back here, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's home, it's a small environment and everybody's so excited about it. So it's, it's really, really a fun, uh, fun project. It's a boy. I didn't have any idea how much work it was going to be, but Right, and getting, right. getting charts together, printing, copying the books, you know, pulling everybody together. But like I said, Dave Dickey and Kevin Giannino, I, Giannino, I couldn't do it without them. So, thank you. Yeah, that's, I, that's so important. I mean, you mentioned your wife's support and the support of everyone around you. And it's, it's just so nice that like you moved home and you're creating this with these, with these friends of yours that you've known forever and then involving the high school students. It's kind of like coming for full circle on a lot of things so that's yeah. just fantastic um well, i was i was very adamant about wanting to include um, you know the kids because it's uh you know it's it's important to keep you know keep music live music alive in mm -hmm. general. 
Um, so if they're excited about it and pra actually practicing and doing it, then it's like they deserve a shot to get in this and, and, and be part of it. You know? So it's, it's really, it's really cool. Absolutely. Yes. And, and I, I think like having had the experience that you had with school band and that influence that it had on you and the support system that it gave and all of that, being able to give that back, that's a huge deal. It is, yeah, I, I'm happy to do it. I mean, I really didn't think about it that way, but it's been presented to me that way a few times now. And it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it is, it's fun to do. I'm, I'm happy to be in a position to, to, to do it. Um, but I will admit it's a little bit of a selfish thing too, because I want, I really just want to play this music. And it's, it's, yeah, where, it's where I started, it's where I started doing it. And it's, uh, it's one of the styles and one of the genres and one of the, you know, formats of being a drummer in a band. It's just my favorite thing to do. And Absolutely. So it's the inspiration that, uh, that kind of got me so seriously involved in it when I was young. So, That's so great. And I do remember you talking about growing up in, um, or being young and playing to records and, and listening to rock music and kind of like leading into swing music. And I always find it so interesting, like, the rock, the original rock drummers, rock and roll, you know, the, the, the ones that I always listen to. And it seemed like from your list that I've, that I've heard about those drummers, they had like a swing to their, to their rock drumming. It was, there was something about it where they, and they were influenced by jazz drumming. So it's just kind of like a, it's an interesting connection there. Well, it is, I mean, you know, it, it, um, it all started with jazz. It started with, with the swing, with the triplet, and uh, you know, progressed into straight eights and, and rock and roll music. So, yeah, when you're when you're thinking about guys like Bonham and Ian Pace, and you know, I mean, the list goes on. But you, you go look at those guys and their drum sets, and I mean, it's uh, it, everybody was playing a four or five piece kit, and the cymbals were set up the same as, as the jazz guys, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like. I mean, even even Clyde Stubblefield with James Brown in the beginning was playing four piece kit with a slanted snare and traditional grip, you know. So it was um, absolutely. It kind of all, you know, it did start with that, and um, I think secretly, you know, kind of every rock drummer, you know, was in, influenced by Buddy and, and those you know, those kinds of drummers that uh, uh, they wanted to do that too. You know, so it's hard not to be influenced by that. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And I I'm go ahead. Oh no, I was just wondering how you so so you started out playing to records and then I know that you studied with um Gary Chester. Um and I'm just wondering how that transitioned because you you developed this really incredible style of playing. So you play all of these genres, but really with your own feel. And I know that um, you know, Gary's kind of method on the drum set with having the the left side and the right side, and it kind of like promotes the limb independence. And I'm just kind of like wondering how that affected your transition into what you created. You're like your own genre, really, that you created. Well, I mean, honestly, I have to go back way before Gary. I mean, Gary, I was already 22 years old, I think, by the time that I hit Gary Chester. And, and of course, I'll talk about that in a second. But, but previous, um, you know, it was really my 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 guys here in St. Louis that gave me the groundwork and, mm -hmm. and to, to you know to get into certain ways of playing. My first teacher was uh, on, on on a consistent, serious level was Bob Matheny. Bob helped me um, get my chart reading together when I was when I was young, when I was fourteen. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the reason I got in the band. I could have actually learned how to read by then. So um, you know, Bob was was. Um, was heavily influential in, in giving me that really solid groundwork to start, and uh, and so it was. A, there was a lot of reading going on with Bob, and then then he suggested I go see Joe Berger, and Joe, again, he was prepping me for college, so we were studying marimba, we were doing all kinds of different things and technical stuff, and and uh, and also kind of actually almost prior to those guys or around the same time, I took a few lessons with another drummer from St. Louis here called, uh, his name is John DiMartino. And John, it's, uh, because I only took a couple of lessons with him, I, I kind of have forgotten to mention him along the way, which I feel bad about. But um, 
but I, but we've we've reconnected, and all these guys are still here. They're still around, and it's like they're I'm including them in all these. You know, I invited them to the rehearsal. We, you know, we hang and talk a lot. So, um, and Fred Pierce too. The, the studio drum shop is here. That's one of the oldest drum shops in the nation. And um, so they, these guys all go back to my beginning. You know, and um, so you know John DiMartino. I, I've, I've heard him reference it, you know, as being like the Steve Gadd of St. Louis back in the '70s, and, he, and it was kind of like that. He played, he played this big drum set, though. He had his own thing; it was very different, and he had a, a foot that was just ridiculous. And and part of that whole thing with his right foot, um, he played this pedal called the Monster Pedal, which was built for Larry London. And I still, ha I, I got one of these pedals when I was 13 and I could barely press the thing down when I was that <laughs> young. But it did develop my calves, that's for sure, at least my right one. Um, so I, I developed my heel up playing with that pedal, which was this big, huge wrought iron thing, with double springs and a big, solid wood block and, uh, for, a, for a beater. And uh, so that's kind of where I got my, my foot chops together when I was really young. And um, and yeah, so, and I would go see John play with a group here called Pisces Triangle, and, and it was just, man, it's, I've actually still got cassettes that I've since digitized and sent to him and shared with all these things, so, so that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, between, between John, Bob, and Joe, those guys were, were really responsible for my foundation, and then of course I practiced my butt off, and I spent a lot of time in the practice room listening, um, mm -hmm analyzing, dissecting, and uh, trying to copy all, the, all these great players that I was listening to, which which primarily, you know, it's like I said, I, I didn't identify rock drummers when I was actually playing to the songs. Mm -hmm. I just the songs, so I was playing to different stuff, everything from Creedence Clearwater Revival to the Monkees to a little bit of the Beatles to, you know, so, I don't know, it was kind of more like pop rock stuff, basically, that I was playing to. And my dad was a, was a, um, I don't want to say amateur. I mean, he played piano and he used to gig when, before the army and stuff. And he always he was always shy and had stage fright, so he never pursued it. Um, but he would always play. You know, I still have his piano here in the house. It's an old Wurlitzer from the late thirties. You know, so it's and we would we would actually play together. And he had uh, he loved Dixieland and Stride piano, so he uh, he had these records from Pete Fountain by that player. Wow. And um, and the drummer was Jack Sperling. And Jack was, um, I didn't know it at the time, but he was, he was probably the best teacher a, a young kid could have to get introduced to jazz because he, he played very clean. His drum sound was incredibly natural and beautiful. Um, and and he, played, he played great. He didn't play too much, but when he did play things, it was discernible. I could, I could actually figure them out. I could listen to them and... and um, you know, he was he was great. He was just an incredible player, and I got to meet Jack later in life, which was which was a treat. Um, but it was the it was the, when my dad brought home the first Buddy Rich record that it was like oh, it's, it's, it's really nuts. So. That's amazing. It's amazing to remember those moments where you you know you've had you had like a revelation, you know, <laughs> like about yeah. music. Exactly. Well, I mean, luckily, you know, like when I was around fifteen or so, I. I I was uh, through the big band at high school. Uh, I was I won a, a, a national uh, NAJE uh, National Association of Jazz Educators award, and the the prize was to uh, I got a scholarship to go to the Stan Kenton Clinic at Drury College in Springfield, Missouri, and. Um, and when I went there, I, I met Tom Kennedy. That's where I met Tom and Ray, his, his, his late brother that you know, just played so great. And uh, we found out that we lived, you know, 30, 40 minutes from one another. So that started a relationship of us playing together all the time. Tom introduced me to Jay Oliver, and that started that whole thing. So, um, you know, it, it, it was definitely... Um, it was it was an interesting journey, you know, that uh, that had a lot to do with my friends here, the people here. But uh, I remember Ray. We used to go see the big bands together, and I remember. Um, I'm pretty sure it was to see Maynard Ferguson at the time. I don't. I'm actually, I'm not sure who it was, but it was either Maynard or Buddy. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Kenton, but. Um, 
anyway, we're in a parking lot. And he says, hey, man, come in. I want to play something. And he sticks in a cassette. And, uh, and, <clears throat> and I was listening. I was just, I'd never heard anything like it. I'd never heard drumming like that. And, um, and it was it was Chick Corea's Leprechaun record with Gad. Wow. And so that that kind of started this whole other, you know, uh, quest to find everything that Gad was on. And, uh, and yeah, so <laughs> and that turned into other fusion where you know, I discovered Billy Cobham and then um, Harvey, um, Harvey Mason and like, you know, all, all these things started to come out of the woodwork and Gina Vanelli with Mark Craney and like there was all, the, all these different records and players and influences. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it was, a, it was just, it was a cool time because all this stuff was just, a, it was flooding, you know, in, mm -hmm. it was like, I, I couldn't absorb it fast enough, you know, but I just remember a lot of hours playing to those records and, um, and then that's the first time I had ever heard Michael Brecker on, which was on Crosswinds and on, on the Pleasant Pheasant, I believe, was the song on Billy's record. And wow. so then I, then I discovered the, the Brecker brothers through that. And then it's like, oh man, who's this bass player? Will Lee sounds amazing, you know. So yes. you know, so I end up got I get to play, I got to play with these guys, you know. And it's like uh, so that was the dream. That was kind of a, you know, that's what that's uh, I had the uh, I got enough courage to leave St. Louis when I was 19 and head east and try to get into New York and you know, it worked out okay. So it did. <laughs> it definitely did. That was that was a good jump for sure. Um and but I love I love that, you know, your influences aren't are your peers, you know. It, it's just it really is an amazing thing. And and uh, I, I think I read somewhere that it was it Peter Erskine that recommended you for your first touring gig was that right yeah not necessarily touring but um but it, yes it was it was peter that was really uh responsible for getting me into the scene in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and he talks about this I, I he had never told me or we had never talked about it actually uh, one on one but but when when jay and i did this um this project uh, of ours called Convergence um, a few years ago now. Um, Steve Orkin had uh, our, our partner in all this and my partner in my drum school and semi-marketing manager that, that I use. Uh, Steve had this idea to do a DVD which was to put together kind of like the making of Convergence. Mm -hmm. And he got a few interviews and one of them was Peter. And Peter actually talks about that night. And I was just like, Wow, really? You know, I never knew that. You know, so wow. it, was, it was kind of cool. Yeah, um, that's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, Peter, an endorsement from Peter, especially like early on, is is such it's such a great thing. I mean, he's just he's he's any, a legend. Any endorsement from Peter at any time was is, is something to to value and cherish. So I, <clears throat> yeah, that night that I'm referencing was um, this was with a band called Night Sprite, which was kind of, when I got to college at the University of Bridgeport in 79, um, Neil Slater was directing the band and Paul Anthony was the bass player, great bass player in, uh, in the New York area. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and so Paul said, uh, hey, we got this band. Uh, he's playing with this band with Brendan O'Keefe and Andy Block. And it wasn't called anything at that point. Maybe they had a different name. And, and then Fred Vigdor, who was a sax player in, in at the Bridgeport University? Um, we we pulled him too. We all, me and Fred, joined this band, and um, and we started because uh, Brandon was writing all this stuff, Andy was writing stuff, but I wanted to do some some chick tunes, you know, and um, and I was, you know, at that point heavily influenced by Gad, and and uh, you know, Night Sprite was one of my favorite tunes with Anthony Jackson. And, Talking about that in a second too, because Anthony was responsible after Peter. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, we started doing Night Sprite, and this I said, "Hey, now let's name the band Night Sprite." So Night Sprite became pretty famous in its little, you know, uh, local area there of playing gigs, and eventually we got we got to work at the Breakfast Brothers Club in in New York, mm -hmm. uh, 
called Sun Family South, and we were playing the Kells. We were doing all kinds of different gigs, and Andy was studying with, uh, with my with our great friend Steve Kahn, great guitar player, all the public access records and stuff. And so I, um, <clears throat> I didn't know I didn't know Steve at the time, but at the time Peter was either living with or hanging with Steve Kahn. So. And I was writing letters to Peter anyway when I was a kid. Just I, I don't even know if you heard these cassettes, but I would write him letters and send cassettes and all this stuff. So anyway, that part I didn't really get clear on if he if he knew who I was before he came. But but anyway, they they both came to the show at Seventh Avenue South, and that's the night that I'm referring to that Peter saw the band and, and he immediately recommended me for French Toast, which was this band led by Peter Gordon um, with Sandy Figueroa and. You know, Lou, Lou Soloff and and, um, and Michelle Camillo mm -hmm. and Anthony Jackson and you know and uh, I'm skipping a few people. I don't remember the whole band, but but uh, but it, that was kind of the what what evolved into the Michelle Camillo band, and those were some of the most memorable times of my career. Really, but, uh, playing with Michelle and Anthony and Lou Soloff and and um, it was Chris Hunter. Was the sax player for a while? Jerry Dodge and that's the that's who I was missing um, <clears throat> in the other one. But um, but man, we, McKell's was our home, you know. Pat McKell in 90, it was '96 in Columbus, I think. and um, we did a lot of gigs there. And um, Anthony, when uh, he didn't know who I was, I was just some kid. Um, <clears throat> but we hooked up so well, and he was just so excited um, and about playing with me i was just like wow really <laughs> you know it was it blew me away anyway we, we we just we just had a great time and he started recommending me for everything everything in town and um so he recommended me for the simon and garfunkel gig and i remember paul simon walking into that same club seventh avenue south i was playing with ronnie Cuber and tom marty was on bass and remember who else was on that gig but i remember paul walking up sitting down staying for two or three tunes getting up and leaving and never talked to him never nothing you know the next morning phone rings and yeah, paul would like to hire you for the toast oh my god <laughs> so, yeah so then that that sort of kicked off the whole um that was that was me getting into the scene and um and then i met everybody i met the breakers and met you know all the guys in the studios and started doing records and and then uh yeah then the next thing was uh, was the whole chick episode you know because it kind of grew out of that and it's all related because i was playing with uh with bill connor's great bill connor's and tom kennedy mm -hmm. at uh at the uh, no longer in existence bottom line in new york and, um, and i'm playing we're playing and we're playing and i see I see, and it was, I knew what Chick looked like, so I was just seeing this little guy walking fast down the, in the middle of the club, you know, I'm like, it's like, oh man, that's Chick. <laughs> and oh I, proceeded, I proceeded to hit something the wrong way. I told the story a yeah. hundred times, but my floor tom completely fell over into me, you know, because I, I had my floor tom hooked onto the cymbal stand, and I, I must have hit something or moved something or something uh, unconsciously. And, drum and cymbals like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway so that was he came back afterwards and invited me to come out to, to the west coast for the electric man you know, it was late probably late 84. so that's kind of the you know the development um but getting back to your i'm sorry i jumped out of way out of no uh, no that's that's it, that's an amazing progression i think like i just want to jump in and say one thing which is it just shows the connections that kind of lead to the next thing. And, you know, once you have established a relationship with someone who really appreciates your playing and they recommend you for the next gig, and it's just like, what an amazing career progression. Um, yeah, it, it, I always tell students or anybody that wants to listen, you know, is that, uh, you know, you never know who's in the room. You never know who's listening to you do some stupid gig that you don't want to be doing, or maybe it's a gig you do want to be doing. But regardless, that's why I sort of have adapted the mentality and just the you know the ethic of um, you know every time I play, I play like it's the last time I'm going to play. It's like I'm, I'm not there to to 
do it half-assed, you know, it's, and mm -hmm. it's just my, my work ethic since day one, you know, it's just like, okay, this is, this is serious. I'm going to, we're, we're going to play now. Okay. We'll, we'll have a little bit of fun, but you know, like, this is, <laughs> this is serious. So, um, yeah. And that, that is, that has gotten a lot of people, a lot of gigs, you know, and it kind of happened here. I mean, I walked in to hear these guys playing, which I'll talk about next, which is a, another contingent that I'm developing here in St. Louis. But, you know, I hear these guys, and it's like, what? Holy, where did this guy, where did this come from? And I had no idea. But, but getting back to your, your question about, um, um, you know, the teacher thing and Gary Chester in particular, here's, here's that story because it's kind of funny and it's, uh, it's sort of um, put me in my place pretty quick. I was 22, and this was just before all that French toast stuff happened. Um, and it was before, before Night Sprite, I think, actually played, and that whole thing happened with the gig. I don't remember. It was around that period. So, um, and I'm sure I'll, I'll get flack from, from this, too, but I, I can't remember who, who told me to go study with Gary Chester. I, I don't remember where that suggestion came from um anyway I, I i didn't know who this guy was because he's you know the, he wasn't playing anywhere he was not really a name on records that i that i knew mm -hmm. and i was like okay i'm gonna go to this guy and but i knew he was a great studio drummer and that was where i want to be going so um, I said, okay, I'm going to go study with this guy. And if I can do everything he wants me to do, then I'm just going to put my sticks down and I'm going to say, okay, Gary, get me some gigs, get me some work, get me in the studio. You can't teach me anything. The first five minutes of the lesson, I was like, holy crap, I couldn't do anything. I mean, like nothing. And I thought my independence was pretty good. <laughs> so I just kind of went home with my tail between my legs and was like, Okay, I guess I need to shut up and go back and practice a little more. And that was, um, I probably spent about nine months or a year or so off and on with Gary. Um, and it was, you know, to this day, some of the most, you know, uh, profound teaching and, and, and learning and, and practicing that, that I've gone through, you know, in my career. It was just tough. I finally had to stop studying with him because I was forgetting how to go around the drums, sure. just practicing all this crazy independent stuff. But man, it's I I tell you know tell my students now that it's everybody has to go through new breed. Mm -hmm. You got you you have to because it's just so good. It's just so um, um, uh, important to to separate the limbs and you know gary's whole thing is using the voice with the fifth independence so you're cutting you're singing quarter notes you're singing what you're playing you're seeing individual limbs you're, you're leading with the right leading with the left it's like there's all this stuff going on right so um and and i think the biggest thing that it helped me do was it improved my concentration level to be very consistent um because i could actually consistently hear what it was that i was doing in a way that I couldn't know how to listen to myself doing that and before Gary. Um, by doing all of that kind of microscopic thing and focusing with the voice on the individual limbs and the individual, um, you know, inner, uh, inner rhythms, inner, inner grooves, beats that were going on within the whole groove, within the whole thing, mm -hmm. uh, really kind of, um, for the first time, taught me how to listen to myself and and put things certain things on autopilot while going in and with your ear inspecting what was going on with just the left hand or just the right foot and um and that then in turn kind of taught me how to listen to uh, myself in a band which is mm -hmm. uh, and and, and these days with ear monitors and things like that it gets uh, it, it's a little more hard to do that um, because you don't really know what you're listening to. You're, you're either controlling the mix yourself or somebody else is doing it, which is worse. Um, but either way, it's uh, these can be dangerous when it comes to, you know, playing in a balance with, with other people. So I, again, I, I, it's my method of operation is to always 
play without them in the first song or two in sound check so that I understand where we are as a band balancing mm -hmm. how I touch, you know, what I have to do to play the correct volume for what I feel is correct for the music we're playing. If I just stick these things in and I mix it how I want, it's like, I got no idea. I'm just, I'm, I'm playing in the dark because there's no reference. It's, it's kind right. of false reference, you know, if you were. So that's sort of my, my method with the in-ears that, the, but, um, um, you know, I'd, I'd prefer to play without them if I could, but it's, you know, we all know that it's not safe to do that for your hearing. So, um, uh, the in-ears and, um, earplugs and such has definitely saved my career, uh, I would say. To yeah. Uh, so, so important. And I remember you giving that advice actually during that PAS drum set competition. I remember you saying that to, to listen to the band just natural to get that feel for you know everything that's going on and the volume and listening to each other and all of that before you put the in-ears in and, and that makes a ton of sense um yeah well i think i think you know a lot of music um not only today in the past too i mean you know heavier heavier music uh, kind of lends itself to um to, to, to balance, you know, not being as important because if you're going to protect your ears, you're either stuffing in earplugs and then you can't hear a damn thing anyways, or, or you're doing the in ears that again, you're either manipulating the mix um, so that it's comfortable for yourself mm -hmm. uh, or someone else is doing it. And you know, whatever the case, it, it's not realistic. So um, it, I learned more about that with Chick, I think, than anybody else when we did the trio gigs because, um, especially when I'm talking about later, um, the last you know, the last few years that we were doing it together in 2017, 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, you know, Chick really wanted to approach uh, the trio thing from a very authentic place, which was in the old days, there were no monitors, they were, you know, everybody sat up close to one another and, you know, of course the drums back then were softer right. Some symbols were smaller softer mm -hmm. you know so i learned a great deal about about how to touch even I, mean, I always considered myself to have fairly decent touch and could play soft but but it's a whole other ball game when you're when you're trying to hear an acoustic piano i mean we still use monitors a little bit but i i had to um i had to change a lot of things i, I actually got a prototype stick made that was lighter. And I got a, um, develop a flat ride because Chick loved flat rides. And so I started to mess around a lot with them. And, and uh, with Sabian, we designed uh, the Serenity ride, which is a beautiful flat ride. Mm -hmm. Two of the drums different, had, you know, bebop drums, smaller. Um, and I had to reprogram a lot, you know, because because it's hard. It's hard to it's hard to get the vibe and the feeling and the, and the passion through your playing, especially if you grew up playing harder, whether it's rock, fusion, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's easy to play loud. It's very easy, but it's it's incredibly different difficult to play expressively at a softer volume. Right. And, and um, I was talking to to Joe Meyer, who's a local drummer here in town. I was just talking to him yesterday and. He said he, he studied with, um, uh, with a bass player here uh, in town, and I'm spacing on the name, sorry, Joe. And, but he said, it, he said the lessons with this guy were so great because he said the first lesson he walked in, it was an acoustic bass, and, and, and there was a set of drums there, and, and he said the guy said, okay, the first lesson is, um, if you can't hear me, you're too loud. And he was playing acoustic bass with no amp. Wow. Yeah, so you have to, you know, so that's like, that's brilliant. That's, that's, that's yeah. great. I think everybody should have to do that because you, then you, you understand. It's like, okay, let me let me go and get something and pad down the bass drum and put a piece right. of on the cymbal or do something if I don't have exactly the gear that I'm supposed to be using for this. I got to hear this guy. And he wouldn't let him play brushes. He said, no, oh. use sticks. Got to use sticks. And so you have to hear me. So you learn a lot that's about that touch and playing music when you have to play it softer and still, like I said, create the vibe, create the feel. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenge. 
Uh, absolutely. I think dynamics are one of those things that is really, it's really helpful to have lessons from someone. It's helpful to have a mentor. It's in that case, because that's one of the things that you don't necessarily nuanced thing dynamics you know learning to play softly and learning to play to the music i think and um it is it is hard it is hard and i think that's maybe one thing that's missing a little bit um that i appreciate and that's another piece of feedback i heard a little bit um at that that competition where you know it was it was there was a lot of talk about dynamics i think what, that's one of the things that is super yeah. important um and you actually, I mean, you, well, you have, you have lessons, you teach. Um, I love that you do private Zoom lessons. I actually didn't know that. And um, that's fantastic. I mean, for, I, I feel like modern times and, you know, through the pandemic and post pandemic with all the technology, it's been an amazing opportunity for drummers to connect with someone like you who they might want to take a lesson with. Um, but previously, you know, it was probably tough. You were on the road all the time and technology wasn't what it is now. Yeah. Well, you know, the pandemic was certainly good for that, um, for a lot of people and the companies too, because the, the technology advanced pretty hard because it had to, it was, it was mm -hmm. to like make it work. So, um, I had always wanted to do online lessons, but I just completely blew it off because of, um, uh, you know the the volume and the, the sound of the drums and like that whole thing and i was just like there's no way unless you like really like stop everything else in life and like dive into understanding how to do it and take weeks if not months to, to like get it happening so okay the pandemic came along life stopped so i had the time to do it and there was like no uh, excuse there was i i had to do it because it was it was, it was as well as a um you know, keeping me sane and, you know, giving me something to do, it was uh, survival. I mean, I had to replace, you know, touring uh, income that went away. So I gave it a shot and I, uh, luckily I, I, um, I talked to Don Fondulero because I know that he was, he was one of the, the heavy online teachers. And I said, Don, who do I talk to? What do I do here? He goes, oh, you got to go see Jim Toscana. I said, okay, so I, I contacted Jim, and now Jim is like the guru. I said, because I've sent everybody to him, because people That's ask great. me, don't ask me, go to Jim, just he'll tell you how to do this, because he stays up on all of the current stuff. And um, and so, yeah, I went and got my switcher, and, you know, I already had my camera scene kind of happening, and lighting and everything, because of my um, online school, which had been going for a year already, when the mm -hmm. pandemic hit. But the, but the live thing, the streaming and like figuring out how to do the vocal and like how I was going to get the sound. And then, then I really got into it. I figured out how to get, you know, my Pro Tools rig and my recorded sound through the switcher and into the camera and into the thing. And then it's, so I, I developed a pretty, a pretty cool one. And um, when, I was, when I was at a studio that I could do it at, I was, including my one in LA for a, a while, I was doing live online. Uh, we call them hangs after a while, and uh, and I would always have fun getting preparing for the week. It became my gig, you know. It's like yeah. it's, I because I was going to be live in front of however many people tuned in, and it's like, well, okay, if I'm going to be playing live, I got to I got to keep my chops up. This is the gig, you know. So yeah. it was an inspiration to do that. It's like another thing I tell students a lot is to tr is to create the inspiration to practice, you know, because a lot of people will say sometimes. Um, a lot of people will say, oh, I don't, I don't have anything to practice for, which, of course, is ridiculous if you are wanting to progress. It's, you know, just, the, just the ability to be able to play better is a reason to practice. But, um, but a lot of people have problems if they're not practicing for a real reason, like what's the gig when they practice mm -hmm. anymore, you know? So I kind of took it upon myself to say, okay, this, let's create a gig. And, you know, the yes. online was was it and so every week or every two weeks you know whatever it, it, it was um put me in that position and in the technology like i said i just kept uh, kept working at it and, and getting better with it but um but that's how i do it i, I use pro tools and my you know my system to uh, to be the microphone uh, 
of mm-hmm. the session. You know, that's what we're doing now. I'm basically talking through a Pro Tools session even with this, because um, that's where the rest of the mics are coming from. So, sure. uh, yeah, so it, it's um, the online lesson thing. I, like I said, it, it got, uh, I was, it was very busy in the first year of the pandemic, and, uh, and I still do it. Um, I still do it as much as I can. Like, like I said, right now, it's uh, thankfully we're back out to touring a little bit more. Uh, and I'm uh, with these two bands now going on in St. Louis. I'm really busy with that. But building my studio downstairs here is like uh, it's a nightmare. It's like, yeah, that's been the focus. So, but when I get it back going, I'll be back on doing a lot of different stuff. But yeah, I'm set up here in my office with you know, these silent heads and you know, silent symbols. So, so I can definitely teach. Uh, mm-hmm. and I, um, uh, so yeah, any, anybody wanting to do that can access uh, access me through my website. And, uh, I think I think the topic or the tab is learn or something like that. But um, yeah, there's kind of a form to fill out. You hit the email and I'll get back to you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will link all of that too in the uh, podcast um, show notes and in the YouTube description too. So anyone can can find you there. And I just, I'm thinking back to you writing letters to Peter Erskine. And that's that's what I did too. I would write to, you know, the drummers that were, that were influential to me and not only tell them that, but maybe ask for some advice, like that kind of thing. And now it's amazing though, that people can contact you through your website now and actually book a lesson like that's fascinating to me and and it's just the that's like the best thing i think that came out of the pandemic really yeah yeah i mean it's it, i mean it gets a little bit a little bit heavy sometimes cuz you know the, the downside of the social media thing is that everybody thinks that you know you can just private message somebody and that you know right. it's going to hit you back and it's like Okay, folks. It's like I, you know, it's like, I don't want to be a jerk here, but it's like there's not time. There's just not time to answer everybody personally, and then it's like you gotta have a little bit, of, you know, personal space too. So I try to keep, I try to keep the website for the business. You know, yes. so I was tell people if they if they hit me on the messenger thing, it's like you know you gotta go through the, the channels, you know, because I'm mean, just I mean, you can't do that with everybody. It doesn't work. So yeah, um, yeah. But but that's why we we have the website designed to you know to get that communication going. And the, I mean the real cool thing uh, where I do I do interact with everybody uh, is is in my school, my online school. Mm-hmm. That is um, uh, we have a private Facebook page, you know, group, and, uh, and and it's a really cool forum. There's been there's been guys in there since the beginning, like going on four years, you know. They, they they chime in and help people too and it's like a whole whole thing where you know uh, folks will upload videos and I'll critique them and they'll ask questions I'll get in there and they're good as much as I can be to, to keep that going so so that's my um, that's kind of the one way that I do connect with, with, with people and the students through there because it's yeah it's just a I'd love to answer everybody's questions and be in touch with everybody like you know, directly but it's like and get nothing else done you know? no that's like a full-time job right <laughs> it is I mean, really yeah, well i'm my own manager i always kind of always have been so it's uh, you know I, I sometimes don't get out of this office you know until the afternoon just trying to keep up with you know current things what's coming thinking about hustling the next thing after that it's like man it's, it's pretty you know stop yeah. So. And now, and now, like you said, you're back out, you're playing. Um, I, I did see that the drum fantasy camp happened uh, just recently, right? You were with um, yeah. Yeah, Mark we, Juliana uh, and Steve Smith and Simon Phillips and Thomas Lang. I think that was the. No, Lang, Lang, was, Lang wasn't there, but, but oh. it was, uh, but it was just me and me, Simon, Mark and Steve. And, uh, and then Chris and Paul and with the, with the band with Vinnie Valentino and it was yes. probably, it was just a we we had a great time it was really really good it was it was a lot of fun and um, it was nice to be nice to be in L A again kind of <laughs> that's uh, yeah. Hollywood's not the uh, not the greatest place to be to, to hang out or you know, think about L A but um, but it was just so much so much fun to hang with the guys. I mean, we spent most of the time inside anyway, and teaching and the students and everybody was really, I think it was sold out. I think it was a lot of, a lot of people there. So, you know, and Steve brought a great camp. They're having the, 
and jam sessions at night where the kids get to play with this incredible band. You know, it's like great, great thing. So, yeah, we have we have been doing that. And then I can't I can't forget to mention that you will be performing at the PASIC convention this November in Indianapolis, um, which is super exciting. I can't wait to see you play there. Thanks. Yeah, I um, was talking to Joshua about it, and I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do yet, but it'll, it'll probably be just the clinic format, you know, talking about a topic or two and playing some tracks and playing and answering some questions and hanging out. So, so that'll be fun. Yeah, we're really, yeah. really looking forward to it. I haven't performed at PASIC in a long time. Yeah, it's de it's definitely been a while. It, it's um, November 9th through the twelfth is the PACIC convention. Before I yeah. forget to mention that, I'm I'm so excited about that. The, it's going to be so good. I have to backtrack just a little bit because I wanted to I, I wanted to talk just a couple seconds about this other new group that I'm putting together, which you know the big band is called the the Saint the Saint Louis Big Band Contingent, and so I'm. I'm also starting another group. It's at the moment it's just four pieces, um, but it's kind of just like an R&B, you know, uh, pop groove um, band. And this developed out of these guys that I saw literally down the street from me playing at the Parkside Grill, which is just a great, great little restaurant and, um, and live music. And uh, Jean Ann has the place there, and Rocky, her husband, is the keyboard player. So Rocky Mantia is keyboard and vocals and Teddy McCready, guitar player and vocals. And this bass player that I found here that um, my my first teacher when I was hanging out with Bob Matheny, he said, hey man, you gotta come down to the bistro in St. Louis and hear, hear this uh, this group um, called uh, uh, Good for the Soul. And I said, okay, cool. So I went down there and this the group started playing and this bass player from the first note i couldn't take my eyes or my ears off of this guy and i was like who is this guy where did he come from he's, he's not a youngster i should have maybe known him by the when i was here but i think he's just a little younger than me and i just didn't know that circle of people this guy's name is john kane and i swear to god i haven't heard it. it's like this guy is coming from like Chuck Rainey and Willie Weeks and like uh, all of the, the, you know, Anthony's in there a little bit, but it's, man, the way this guy plays, it's so funky. I mean, he just plays all the right notes and it's, you know, um, it, it's such a vibe. And I just, I mean, he almost brought me to tears at the gig. I walked up to him, I said, I said, John, I, I don't know if you know who I am or not, you did, but, but I said, I got to play with you, you know, so. So we sat her into the place and a few a couple of weeks later, and, and it, it, the hookup was as good as I thought it was going to be. So I said, okay, I, I want to start this group, guys. I want to do the St. Louis Groove Contingent. So nice. I'm starting that as well, and we got our first little gig coming up on September 10th um, at the Parkside Grill. We're supposed to be outside just to do a little, you know, kind of you know, fun, fun gig. And then we'll, my idea is to record this group. Um, and along with the big band too, I said that earlier, but I want to record this group. It's going to hopefully be the first project I do here at the studio. And um, I'm going to be inviting my, my friend, Chrissy Poland, who is uh, who is a singer at Film Fantasy Camp. And I'm going to invite her in on this project too. So it's uh, it's uh, really looking forward to that. But uh, yeah, these, these guys are just amazing players here. So it's um, not not only do I want to play with them and have fun doing it, I want to, people to know who these folks are it's great really great people and players and singers wow it's just fantastic so I've, I've got these two different things going that couldn't be the more opposite from one another you know <laughs> different things that different completely different setups for things and, and just the whole vibe it's like it's like you know it's like taking the acting hat off from this movie and then you go to this movie and you know you play in that one so right uh, but heavily influenced, heavily influenced in both, and I just I, I love that kind of music. So, so we'll be we playing a lot of different stuff. That's amazing. So, I mean, what I'm gathering is you're really, really like doing what you want to do right now, like what you're what you're feeling inside, and I I love that so much. You're thankfully I'm 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 I'm, I'm in a position that you know right now at least it's working to to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's uh, hopefully I can get through the studio build without uh, forcing me to work too many things that I don't want to do. But uh, sure. it's, uh, 
one thing about having a big studio is it's a big studio. It's a lot of a lot of uh, time and, and uh, financial investment. But, uh, yeah. but once it's done, it's it's going to be great. So. I bet. I bet. I can't, I can't wait to hear the new music too coming out of this. So, nice. so exciting. And nice. I, I do, I do want to mention too, one of the things that we talked about recently um, that I knew about you, but I didn't really know to the extent that you were into it is the car racing. <laughs> and, you know, we, we, we had great conversation about the, the racing and, and that you have this like simulator at home, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, one thing I did not know is you actually have a YouTube channel, like a racing YouTube channel, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's it's kind of more of a thing of the past at this point. Um, to be honest, I'm I'm not. Uh, you know, I remember Gary Meek. You know, my my good friend, sax player. At one time, he, um, I was I was just really getting into it in, in Los Angeles because there, there's like four or five racetracks within two miles of my house, and I'm. Wow. I was taking I was taking lessons from pros. I was like really going for it, you know. And it, it actually culminated in, in a year of uh, doing a spec Corvette series, wheel to wheel racing, which I I just bailed on very quickly, realizing that <laughs> okay, it's not it's not my cup of tea. The whole competition thing, and it's uh, I just like to I like to I like to drive fast. And I like the science of driving, not 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 in a straight line. This is all road racing. So, mm -hmm. so I, I like the science of figuring out how to go around a corner fast and, and just, you know, be faster than everybody else on, on doing a lap, which, of course, I, I, I did maybe a couple times in my uh, brief career as a, as, as a driver. But, um, but yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a very expensive hobby. Um, and, and, uh, it, but what I was going to say is when I was really into it and posting a bunch of stuff, Gary makes says, he texted me one time, he goes, Aren't you a drummer? <laughs> so I was just like, oh, I want to start a YouTube channel. Blah, 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 blah. So, right, yeah, I, right. I got a few videos up there. But it's, it's, it's great. It's, 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 it's great, though. One thing that struck me was the timing of it. Because it, you know, you obviously like the, the connection between drumming and the timing and counting it out. And um, I find myself, I, fi I find myself counting at all times of the day, you know, just in doing normal everyday things. Um, but, but driving, like there's a lot to do with timing and when you time things and how you do it. And so, you so know, check there's, there's a lot of correlation actually. And a lot of it has to do mostly with balance, um, mm. you know, being balanced at the kit, you know, and with your sticks and down to the technical aspect and just the whole, the whole thing of, of balance and, and, you know, aerodynamics has a lot to do with it too. Mm -hmm. Car, it's like keeping the car balanced so that there's you know, even weight distribution is kind of a you know there's times to put more more you know downforce on the front wheel so they turn but you don't want to do that going around the corner you got to put the, put the weight back there again if it's if you got rear wheel drive so yeah it's a lot about balance and correlation timing with you know there's a lot of footwork too in a manual transmission so that you know I I, I found that I could develop the uh, the heel toe technique you know with, right. Uh, keeping the revs going at the same time you're shifting and braking and I can get that pretty easily because of the pedals and all this independence you know so absolutely yeah that, that was fascinating it just it's an interesting thing like you say um you were asked aren't you a drummer you know but um but it is nice to kind of gather inspiration from other things sometimes yeah. and yeah, no, I, I I did it pretty pretty hardcore for about ten years, and I I you know like I said at this point I don't there is a racetrack here and I've been there a couple times, um, but you know the weather isn't as conducive to you know to doing it here because it can rain like I mean there's it's like trying to deal with the forecast here is like a, it's like the biggest culture shock that I've experienced coming back because it's like what's the forecast today on the phone my wife. Libby always gives me a hard time. It's like, hey, what's, the, what's the forecast today? And it's like, <laughs> it says sunny, not a cloud in sight. And then like two hours later, it's a thunderstorm. It's raining. Like, <laughs> or vice versa. You know, it's like you see a track yeah. day. It's like, oh man, but it's supposed to rain. And it never does. It never yeah. Does. Yeah. Well, we have, we always have, we've, you know, I live in New England and it's so similar. You just never know from day to day, yeah. you know, it could be the, the, the temperature range. You just right. don't know layers. I always say, right? Right. right. <laughs> All exactly. we can do. Yeah, but anyway, I you know I've sort of sort of shifted. You know, uh, you know it's uh, yeah. If I if I do drive these days, like you said, most of it's on a simulator, which is not not a 
not a crazy motion simulator or anything, but it's 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 a nice rig with you know mostly Fanatec gear for those of you who know. And um, you get on there and I racing and you know get to race people in different parts of the world and you know it's online stuff and it's it's super super really high resolution really looks if you watch some of the stuff online it looks like a real race but the graphics are unbelievably incredible. But you know, you don't. Of course, it's not like a real car unless you have motion where you can actually get jilted around. But you know, right, I don't need to do that. So yeah, <laughs> you don't need and to at be bumper point, up. At this point, I'm kind of really focusing back into kind of where the focus should be in the first place. But, but yeah, the hobby it was it was fun while it, while it kind of lasted, and I may I may do it still for a little while longer. But yeah, but there yeah, you go. It, it That's great. That's great. But I am so excited for you with the new studio. Um, I can't wait to hear that it's done and can't wait to hear the music coming out of it either. Me too. <laughs> great. <laughs> It'll That's be great. Exciting. I can't wait. It's, uh, yeah, but it's yeah. getting there. It's getting there. It's definitely getting there. I'm, I'm actually be putting on gloves and staining my own wood this week. So I'm going to get down there. I've been, I've been trying to, you know, uh, partake as much as I can without hurting myself. So, um, yeah. so staining, I can. I can you can do the staining. That's good. No, that, that's that's fantastic. And I will definitely link your website and um, the teaching link and all of those things um, so people can follow along and see these gigs that you're talking about. Great. Um, and then also, you know, PASIC. I'll uh, put a link in there to uh, to PASIC. So if anyone wants to come and see you play and do the clinic. Um, and tell, yeah. tell us where PASIC is again so everybody knows because that uh, yes. Where is it is at the Indianapolis Convention Center, right in the heart of Indianapolis. And it's November 9th through the 12th. And Dave will be there performing, many other drummers. Um, it's very educational as well. So, yeah, and if you go, you got to make sure you check out the museum there. It's spectacular. What a, what a cool thing. I never even knew it was there. It's right. So the Rhythm Discovery Center, which is right in the. Um, the circle in the city center. It's just yeah. amazing. Really cool. Amazing. Really cool. Well, I'm looking really forward to going. So, um, you know, see, see everybody there. Come on out and hang out. And, um, and yeah, visit. Uh, I know Sarah's going to take care of some links and stuff, but uh, my website is pretty much the home for, for my online school um, and the teaching and uh, all, the, all the gigs that we're going to be doing with these new groups, with Tom Kennedy's group and everything that we got going on. All of that stuff will be posted there. So so many good things i can't wait cool thank you so much sarah for having me today i appreciate thank it you, Dave. thank you as always and i will see you really soon okay sounds good okay take care thanks ciao bye. everybody bye thank you for tuning in today join us each tuesday for new episodes of sarah hagan backstage